Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Rodeo Time, the podcast. We've got Dale Brisby in the house, greatest bull rider ever to walk the earth. We have two very special guests, Mr. Buster Frierson, who is a cowboy by trade, and he's also got a very interesting opportunity for those other people out there that want to be cowboys that I think you guys will be excited to hear about. Also got a couple fight stories What? that he's going to share. Um, we got Drew Merritt Art and Cattle Company. So we're going to find out what that is. Also some fight stories. I didn't share any of my fight stories. Like what, yeah, what that Dude, I don't have I any. wanted to know. Dude, yeah. I'm, I'm riding bulls, punching fools. I've I already see. ridden my bull today. So you, you guys. Pl- I'm, I'm just watching out for being punched. Hey, hey. <laughs> Stand away. These are my life. Check out DaleBrisby.com for the uh, the Rodeo Time apparel. I'd like to thank Mountain Ops for um, supplying us with the Ignite and the energy to do what we do. Rock and roll denim, Can-Am, Total Feeds, and American Hat. Thank you all for listening. You're going to love these stories, how to get started on uh, pursuing your passion when people around you don't think it's a good idea. There you go. <laughs> pow, pow. love that intro music it just gives puts me in a really good mood Let's and i hope it. i hope it does y'all i hope it does our listeners um we are dedicated to bettering this podcast every podcast and so some of our loyal listeners are like rolling their eyes right now early podcasts we had not good audio <laughs> and so i'm even changing this one up i'm gonna do like not like a traditional intro we're just gonna roll right into it buster What's up? What you been doing? Today I've been getting rained on. It's raining out there today, so. Man, other than that, I've just been doing a little bit of anything and everything. We did a podcast with you um, explaining pretty much how to make money as a cowboy. (laughs) And uh, you walked us through, like, the different streams of income that a cowboy can have. Right. And um, which was a super valuable thing for a lot of my followers, you know? Yeah. One thing you've recently added as a value to your audience that is also, um, it's an income stream for you, but it's also an incredible opportunity for somebody that don't know what they're doing. Um, tell us about your clinics. Yeah, so the, I've actually started a opportunity where you can actually come and hang out with me for a couple of days and learn some stockmanship and some horsemanship, you know, like a real working ranch environment, you know, and then like you go, you come hang out and it's very customizable to where your skill level is. It doesn't matter if you know how to ride or you don't know how to ride or you've been riding for 15 years, you know, and then it's like, if you want to, if you want to get out into the real world, as we'd say in the real ranching world where it's not a controlled environment all the time and you're not in an arena and you want to learn how to handle cattle and maybe improve your horsemanship a little bit. I don't know a lot about any of it, but uh, I know a little bit about it. So I'm, I'm willing to help and let you come out and take a couple of days and hang out and we'll teach you a little bit. And I think eventually this will proceed into a longer clinic, like a four or five day long, week long clinic maybe. If, it, if I get enough interest in it. So something that I think uh, maybe preserves the cowboy way and kind of gives somebody that doesn't really have an ideal other than what they see on the Hollywood movies kind of type deal, like the real world, like what we really do, sorting cattle and, you know, dragging calves and doctoring yearlings outside, taking care of just animal husbandry between your horse and your cattle. Yeah, I feel <coughs> like um, <coughs> you're a practitioner. You know, you're a student of the game. Right. So you mentioned, like, you don't know a lot about it when, you know, I think that's you being humble, which is a good thing. But essentially, you are, you're a working cowboy. That's how you make your income. That's your livelihood. You're practicing every day at this. And there are people out there who don't do that. Right. Don't have a way to do that. Right. But they'd like to. And that's the nature of my intern program. 
you know, whether that's with ranching or with rodeo. So the exchange is a little different. They actually get paid because they work in the warehouse also. Right. But then, for instance, yesterday at 3 o'clock, everybody d- – yesterday was a good day for us for uh, to be an intern. So 7.30 to 10 a.m., we were weaning at West Camp. Perfect. And took some calves to the sale barn. They worked in the warehouse from 10 to noon for lunch. And it took a break at lunch, 1 to 3. And then we went to the arena and bucked. Perfect. So they had four hours of work. <laughs> and then the rest of the day was either weaning or – bucking so yesterday was the epitome of why these guys come here and we'll usually if we have really good weather we'll probably have two days like that a week Heck yeah but anyways whatever enough about me the point is is like there are people out there that just don't have access to that kind of experience for instance ty one of my newest interns comes from kentucky you know just there's just not there's not people like dale or buster that have this setup where people can come learn to ranch right right no uh, and it is it's one of those deals where if you're ranching every day you're not going to come see me i mean you're already doing it so it's for people that any skill level whatsoever if they want access to that information and i will give it to them you know i mean it's uh it's one of those deals where you set it up with me like i said it's very customizable it's uh, I'm not going to take any over f- four people per clinic. And if you want to come on a Monday, Tuesday, that's great. If you want to come on Thursday, Friday, I'm fine with that too. As long as it works for both of our schedules, as long as I don't have another something else going on, I mean, we'll, we'll set it up and we'll try to make it fit your schedule and what you want to do. And I've gotten quite a bit of interest. And I, like I say, I posted a couple of stories in the last week and gotten quite a bit of interest and, it surprised me to be real honest because you think in what I do for a living is like, you know, I mean, I go work physical labor to make money and not that this isn't physical labor, but it's, it's educational as well, you know? And so it's like, why would somebody pay me to come hang out and learn information about ranching and cowboy? And it's like what you said, I've been doing it for 25 years and I've been to a lot of different places and I've worked in a lot of different situations and, you know, it's, I had that knowledge and I would like to pass that knowledge on to people that don't right. have that knowledge, you know, and try to keep people educated about the real world, the uh, real ranching, the, like not just the Hollywood movie stuff that you see, but like the everyday building fence and moving cattle and sorting and, you know, doctoring and vaccinating and just kind of keeping everything situated where you have the availability to make money in the ranching industry and you have to do that, you know, I mean, you have to keep your stock tended to. Have you ever done anything like that, Drew, for uh, your uh, painting and and murals that you do? Like a like a clinic? Yeah. Like a, uh, I've done a few like uh, like live painting type of situations, some stuff like that. But uh, I always think it's interesting listening because you've got twenty five plus years living it, all this stuff. And, and it's always the guys that are like, well, you know, I don't know much or whatever. And they do it for a living. It's like, it's like, oh, yeah, I could go learn a lot. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's always old cowboys that are like, well, I don't know much that know right. everything. And even even like last time, whenever I came down here, I think it's cool, like regionally. Like for me, uh, East New Mexico, it's so different regionally, like the way we do things. And then mm-hmm. you come down here. And we were uh, bringing cows up, and just like little little things that I would pick up on, like little little things yeah, with that's like right. horse gear, horsemanship. You helped just, us. Uh, you helped us uh, gather that pe- pen of pasture cows there at Wacomole Camp. Yeah, yeah. Just just for example, because it was like the little things that I would watch y'all do, and it was like, oh yeah, that's not that's not in our vocabulary right. over there. It's just open where y'all have so terrain, and you know, you got like the craziest combination of like we talk about different revenue streams as a cowboy so you uh raised on a on a place in new mexico but um i mean just the the one pager of your story is tagging up train cars (laughs) led to murals on 12-story buildings 
commission paintings. Is that is that kind of like a good summary? So that's a pretty good summary. That's a pretty we we were talking about it a little bit before. Like uh, like I grew up and and all my friends would rodeo and like they they were into that. They'd get into roping. Like my best friends in the fourth grade would bring roping dummies and at recess we'd like rope. Yeah, but. I just didn't have like the passion for that because it was yeah. it was that thing was like man I just did this all day for work, right now we're gonna go do this for fun, <laughs> like it, you know it's yeah, like yeah, yeah and I uh we had uh, one road coming in Saint Vrain, New Mexico uh, is where I grew up and there was one road into the ranch one road out and the train tracks went across it, so it was like we'd be hauling cattle or whatever and we get stopped at the train tracks and you know you just see the graffiti go by, so wow. in my mind as a kid you know it was like there's you get into the big uh, New York, L.A., and those two worlds aren't supposed to exist really together, like the urban art form, graffiti situation, like ranch, rural stuff. Where uh, for me, like I never, it was all like one thing. And, and I always try to like whenever I moved to L.A. and, and uh, was doing that stuff, I would always try to kind of like hide that because I was trying to fit in. And then, I, you know, you move on later and you're like, oh, that's like the one thing that set me apart from every single other person. I'm the only one that I've ever known or heard of. Yeah. So it's kind of it's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah so you recently you I saw you had a, a shirt. It's uh, what's your what would you what would what, you put on it? It was Drew Merritt. Um, was it like? Oh, uh, Merritt Art and Cattle Co. Art and Cattle Co. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I did one, too, that was Merritt Graffiti. Uh, graffiti and cattle co. Yeah, just for like all my LA buddies, because a yeah. lot of them are like, there, there's such a funny thing with graffiti. It's like there's like the street artists that like kind of take pride in that, and then there's like the actual like bombers, like the graffiti writers. It's like this isn't art. Yeah, no, we're we're just search and destroy. So it's kind of it's kind of cool. Yeah, but I it think is neat. yeah, I, you you gotta you gotta look for, you gotta be self aware, and know yourself, and. Number one, be willing to stand out and be unique and be different. And then in that could potentially lie the opportunity, you know, like no it doubt. did like it did for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, no doubt. There's that there's that saying that goes out there. If if you want to fit in, dress like them, talk like them, do what they do. If you want to stand out, don't dress like them, don't talk like them, don't do what they do. You yeah. got to be your own self, which, you know, I mean, that came from Dale Brisby. That's that's Dale Brisby, Drew as well. You know, I mean, like Hello you got to have you got to have some kind of uniqueness. And when you have that uniqueness, then you do stand out. You know, yeah. you're not just a one of the sheep that are of millions that are all the same, you know, which is, you know, yeah. you don't want somebody busting your chops about what you do. Just don't do nothing. Yeah, so recently I you know, I came you guys might have seen my uh my buckle, the the big <laughs> buckle I had, you know, and <laughs> that you won at I the wanted, NFR. I, I like to ask you about that. <laughs> I like being in a lineup of people, you know, because <laughs> lineup of cowboys, you know, especially like walking around at the NFR. So the fact that I got on kind of a retro looking blazer is one thing. Like you might see that everywhere. Right. And then you see that buckle and it's like, all right, that's a little different. Who is then, that? Then there's also long hair. Wait a sec, that's not many of them have long hair. Then you got the most cowboy hats are like six or six and a half inch crown. Well, this is seven, sometimes seven and a half inch crown. And so now it's like, then you add, all right, he's got on glasses indoors, you know. And <laughs> to someone who's not familiar with the industry, they might just be like, oh, okay, this this is unique, maybe, but like. Some people might think he might be serious, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, people in the industry are obviously like, okay, this guy. <laughs> but I like to keep people in that moment of, is he serious or is he not? Kind of like like I start talking and you're not sure, okay, is this is he telling a joke right now or is this a for real story? That's where I like to live. Yeah. Right in there. You do a very good job at that. Yeah, I saw a meme. It's like, it's kind of like, when you tilt your chair back r- and right before it falls, but you're in that space, like you're not sure if it's going to, that's me every mm-hmm. single day. All the time. All that's, the time. That's why the belt buckle was so amazing. Cause right. a little bit bigger and it would have been like, this is, this is everybody knows. Yeah. 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 So yeah. like <clears throat> when we first got it, um, <laughs> we're walking through the uh, cowboy Christmas and stopped to, s- I see someone I know, 
he's standing with uh, some money guy from New York, an investor from New York for this thing, and not been around rodeo. <laughs> and the guy from Montana Silversmiths, who's about to present me the buckle upstairs, I'm I, he shows it to this New Yorker, and then New Yorker goes, oh. Yeah, that's that's a nice buckle. That's <laughs> nice. And so, like in his mind, like he he flew back to New York, maybe even that night, you know. But he flew back, and in his mind, like that was legit. That's, like, that's what, we, what wear. we wear. Yeah, that's, that's what, what we. Wear. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. I can't. And and I, he was probably thinking, I can't believe they wear that, you know. Yeah. But like, really, it's just a <laughs> it's a comical buckle for Dale Brisby, you know. It's uh, like your Captain then, America shield. Even, I thought you were gonna pick it up yeah, and like exactly. he didn't even <laughs> notice. He didn't even comment Sparta! on the. He didn't even comment on the. It said champion this year. <laughs> he didn't even comment on it. He was just like, "Oh yeah, that's cool. That's buckle, good, man. Yeah. That's really pretty. Yeah, <laughs> Dad, go. You won that big buckle. You must be really big. Wh- and when'd good. you When'd you get that? I got that this year. <laughs> this year, I got that this year. Can't you read? <laughs> yeah. So that's that's um, so tell me about like your. Like, I can't. I know you're mirrored glasses. Like I don't know if you're looking at Drew. Or you're looking at me. Or looking like, at Drew. Okay. All right. All right. Cool. Like I was just trying to make sure you like catch up. I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm catch pretty up. slow. I just up, keep Buster. looking at myself. Yeah. Right. I'm like, man. I'm <laughs> looking looking all not looking that bad. Hot. So, um, Drew, just kind of break down what it's like for me because there's a lot of people out there that go down a path, I think the three of us are probably, <clears throat> if we had told our our parents, I know, for instance, my grandparents, like my grandparents told me you need to get a real job when they did not have the same vision I had. So, like, essentially, like, you know, I'm going to be Dale, be the Dale Brisby that I, that I am today. Now... They don't argue as much, you know, 17, 18 employees, they come into the warehouse and they realize it's a tangible, like they can touch it. They understand it. They didn't understand the internet five, seven, 10 years ago. So like they didn't realize where we were headed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's easy now for you. It's easy now for Buster. Like now that you're, you know, like you pull up in a real pickup with real horses, but like those younger people that, are looking to be a cowboy by trade, um, you know, a quote unquote influencer, maybe YouTuber, whatever you want to label me as also additionally a cowboy. And then like you would, you're by trade, you're an artist. And, like these are all professions that when people write them down, if, if you, if a kid were to write this down in high school, <laughs> their teacher would roll their eyes. All three of us sitting on this couch right now, Sure. Would, would get eye rolls had we, you know, had our teachers seen this is what we want to do. But there had to be a point in there. I know there was for me. I want to hear about it from you, Drew, as an artist, because maybe you more than anybody. Um, <clears throat> there had to be a point in there where, like, you had to push through. Not that you're doing something to prove to the rest of the world, because I feel like that's not the best reason to do something. You got to do it for you. But, like, was was that a challenge, and and how did you push through that challenge? Do you mean like uh like with a relationship with people and like getting that kind of acceptance from them, or not not acceptance? I guess maybe word, like your closest circle. I just maybe that's a the wrong assumption. No, no, maybe your yeah, parents yeah. did did support you the whole way through, but like I assume when you are, it's to me like I would think that people's problem with it is they don't understand how you're going to monetize it. Yeah. Yep, like, how are you, you. going to make money? Yeah, that's a, uh, that was so a, like you went, to, you went out to LA to be an artist. Um, I was originally, uh, going to go to Wyo tech with my best friend and we were going to learn how to like, uh, work on cars, a real job, a real job. I yeah. was like trying to figure out, I mean, like as whenever I was young, I remember asking my parents like, Hey, like, can I like be an artist? you know, like for a living. And they were like, yeah, yeah, you can do that. And I was like, well, do they make a lot of money? And they're like, no. And it was like, okay, well, how can I draw and make money? And, and they were like, well, architects, they make money. So then I had it in my mind for like a year when I was in like fourth grade. I was like, I'm going to be an architect. So you wanted to draw as young as like third, fourth grade. 
Yeah, I, I painted my first mural when I was eight. Wow. Dang. Like, my mom, like, they've been supportive, but like you said, like, that, like no one really knows how to, like, monetize those things. Like, right. you had a talent, and then you recognized your yeah, talent. Yeah. But it was like, well, I mean, he's got a really cool talent, but he needs how to go you, get a job. Yeah, how do you make money off yeah, that? And he could do his talent on the side, just kind of as a little, what a, if you'd want to say a side hustle. Exactly. You know, exactly. You, you work down there at the architect place. and you know, Art drop blueprints, yeah. whatever you. Tell me, yeah, what well, I know about that architect Dude. place. I don't know. What, what, do you even, what do you call that? I don't know. <laughs> Dale? I don't know. <laughs> don't ask me. But I don't know either. Yeah. yeah. But, That's uh, one reason I don't do it. Definitely. Well, it has math involved. That's why I gave Bam, up. I was like, I have a couple of trying to do it, you know, and I was, and I was like, I'm done. I'm that. I'm just not. Artist isn't in the thing. But um, but yeah, getting getting that that monetize monetization. Yeah. Now I don't know what to call it. Um, it's it's tough, man. Especially growing up in like those like that our kind of environment. Right. But I mean, like my my dad. It. it I mean, well, y'all know how it is with like cattle. Like, well, sometimes you lose a lot of money, sometimes you break even. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he he kind of had a viewpoint <laughs> of like, well, I mean, you can always do this. You right. can always farm. You can always ranch. You can always do this. This isn't going anywhere. So like, go, yeah, give it a shot. Right. But um, but I was gonna go do a, oh, like uh, learn how to paint cars or something. Just just anything like that. And that's my parents were like, well. Like, I know you're, like, pinstriping cars and painting snowboards for people and doing, like, automotive stuff, but is that, like, what you want to do, or do you want to, like, make art? And they, they were they were really uh, supportive, and they were just, they were just like, we'll, we'll try to go to Dallas, try going to the Art Institute, because that's the only, I mean, that's, like, a graphic design school, and we I'd never had a computer. So that was interesting coming from, oh, I bet. you know, so I, I tried to do that. It, it wasn't art. It just had art in the name, you know. Got you. Didn't didn't know any better. So, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd never been to, like, an art museum or anything until I was, like, 24, 25. Like, just from, you know, yeah. St. Brand, New Mexico. Yeah, it was like, there's there. nothing there, man. There's nothing there. Yeah. So going to Dallas was a culture shock. And then I uh, did that for a few years. And then, um, oh, while I, was, uh, while I was in Dallas at school, my mom and my aunt, I'd always been painting, so there was just a garage full of, like, paintings and drawings, just, like, old house paint, whatever I could find, spray paint, like, graffiti, whatever. Every time we'd go to a, a restaurant, I'd draw on a napkin, like, whoever, like, some old cowboy that was sitting in the back, I'd draw him, I'd draw, like, whatever was around, and my mom had kept all these napkins. I'd just leave them there. I'm like, yeah, so just leave them. But she'd, she took them all, and um, I'm in college, and, I mean, like, a dead end department store job, like thinking like just kept dropping classes. Not the most studious. <laughs> imagine that. And um and, and basically like my mom and my aunt were like, we're gonna have an art show for you. And I was like, what's that? <laughs> so like my aunt took everything down in her house and hung up all these old paintings that I had done or whatever. My mom framed every one of these napkins that I had drawn on. She put them in frames and they just invited their friends and their friends ended up inviting their friends and their friends up invited their friends or whatever and then um i come home from college for my art show i just thought it was going to be more like a like a church function like a bunch of old ladies <laughs> you know like whatever yeah. but packed house everything sold and i went back to dallas and quit my job heck yeah and it was like every one of these napkins that i had sat down and drawn like at the time like i think we sold them each for 30 bucks dang but like if you add that up yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a hundred napkins. It's like, oh, and they all sold, and they were gone, and then it was like, man, I paid for every meal that I ate. Mm -hmm. Right. You know those like little things as a as like a young kid or like you know young college right. age. It's like, wow, there's like something to this. Well, that that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. That it's kind of the opposite for you that you had like that such a supportive, you know, foundation that like not only did they support you, but encouraged it enough to set up a scenario. That showed you you could monetize it exactly, and and I don't think that they really knew what they were doing, but they've always just been like just there, you know. Like it was I, just, I'm very lucky. She probably just had this overwhelming sense of like love when she looked at these napkins. She was like, "I've got to do something with this. They're wasting away in this." Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that was for me. Like I said that about my grandparents. My grandparents were that way, but like my old man was the most supportive. And matter of fact, like. 
he was like the opposite. It was annoying how many ideas he would have. <laughs> like if I was like, I kind of want to do this, he would come an hour later with 10 ideas to add to it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and sometimes it was just a little annoying, you know, <clears> because that's how your dad is when sure. you're no dad this is what i want to do just right. this this is what i want to do i don't need all that other stuff cluttering up my br yeah. cluttering up my brain like this is what i want to do but he actually he died it's kind of the first time i've really put this math together but it was like two months to the day before the first video so he never really got to see this come to fruition you know what what we've been doing for 10 years this july will be 10 years since oh, the first he's video it. yeah he's seeing he's it. seeing it buddy. he's seeing it that's for sure yes sir yeah. Um, so he was super supportive, you know, cause like the main thing that was so outlandish for me to do that normal parents wouldn't have approved of was rodeo. You know what I mean? Like you want to, yeah. you want to like make a YouTube video. That's one thing, but you want to like ride bulls and get on Bronx and faraway lands. Like <laughs> that's a little. And so the fact that he supported me there, which it's his fault that I was doing it anyway, you know, so he couldn't really blame me, but, um, but anyway, my, my, my grandparents did not support me, and it always made me appreciate. It gave me a glimpse of what it might be like if if my parents and immediate family, immediate circle didn't support me, and I've always felt sorry for those people that had to go through that for, like, chasing a dream and not being supported. Um, some There's some people that they don't need that support. They can feed their own fire, yeah. and they can, you know, and that fuels their fire. For me, it did a little, but I was, I, I appreciated that support. It, it was a little bit of both because there there is a difference between um, supporting and understanding. Yeah, because because I mean like there there was times I know my parents they were they were like really supportive or whatever, but it, it, you know it's like oh, that's cute kid, you know, and like you know it was, you know there's there's that thing because they want to support you and they want me to be happy and they want you to be happy, but then understanding like the bigger like you were talking about like the internet. And I yep. think probably like my grandparents were like a little bit like that at the the start too. But I mean, like even having said that though, like my grandparents' house is just covered with my stuff, right? Like from forever. So like, I, like th yeah, the the understanding and the supporting might be two different. Because like uh, also like with graffiti, like. I mean, I'm I'm going out and I'm like getting in trouble and you know doing just like illegal <laughs> stuff every single night, and I mean like I I, I can't be too far off from rodeo. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's pretty. It would be that one's a pretty easier one for a family member to justify not approving of. Mm -hmm. I would imagine. <laughs> um, what do you think, Buster? Like, what advice would you give to someone who's got a net like they're in Kentucky and they don't I mean number one they could sign up for your clinic as a yeah. starter but but like just really to step out of the comfort zone and go against I mean like what if you had done that you know like going into being a professional cowboy I feel like there's probably people that maybe told you you should get a real job oh yeah no doubt i mean even like you say it was the same way growing up and my dad my dad cowboyed and rodeoed you know and that's how kind of how i got into it we had a little farm i guess ranchito whatever you want to call it you know 20 30 acres and we always had horses around my dad broke a lot of horses for the public but he also would be the guy that say hey go down there and get a job yeah because this doesn't make you any money I do this because I like it. I love it. That's what I do. Maybe for a little, I, I go to work at the oil field company, but then I come home and start colts for the public. You know, it's kind of what he did. Trained rope horses. He rope calves in the PRCA for a while when he was young. Rode bareback horses. I mean, he was, rode bulls. I mean, I, we got pictures of all up over the wall of his younger days when he was rodeoing, you know, and so, but you know, just as well as I do, and everybody probably listen to this, that the cowboy lifestyle generally does not pay that much. I mean, you talk about even the professional levels, the PRCA guys. Yeah, you think, oh, they won 275000 this year. Well, they spent 260000 to get that 275000 you know. 
where those guys make their money is at the NFR. You know, if that's yeah. that's where they make their profit. Otherwise, they're just breaking even. And if they can break even, it's a cool lifestyle that they get to live, you know, and that's what they want to do. That's what's in their heart. That's what their soul tells them to do. And so that's what they do. And it's kind of the same way with me, you know. And it's like I, I did. I went to college kind of off and on for three. I went to San Angelo State. I went to Tarleton. I went to West Texas, you know what I mean? But just I'd go a semester, and I was like, man, I don't want to do this. But everybody was telling me that's what I needed to do to make a living. Well, you got to go to college, and then you can get a good job. You know, get a degree, and then you can get a good job. Well, I just it just didn't fit me, and so I went into the labor world. You know, and and I worked for Lone Star Gas for about four years, uh, and was on a construction crew. You know, digging out broken gas lines and installing gas lines and that kind of thing. And then eventually that moved over into working for TU Electric. I worked for TU Electric for five years, climbing poles in Fort Worth. That's how I kind of got moved to Fort Worth because there was a job opening and it paid better than the gas construction job. And so I went there and just the whole time though, I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy with myself. And I was, you know, reaching out, trying to find that happiness. And it, it, it took me to some places where I shouldn't have been and took me to some places that I got in trouble at, you know, and it kind of, that kind of steamrolled into doing other things, and uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's a spiral, downhill spiral. When you're not happy with, your soul's not happy with what you're doing, you try to find something that makes it happy. And uh, finally one day I just like, you know what, I'm done. Like, I'm going back to what I want to do. And at that, you know, it was it was being a cowboy. Like, that's the way I was raised. That's what was in my soul. That's what I wanted to do. And so I guess to your question, what does somebody do? Like, if that's what you want to do, I don't care what it is, whatever you want to do, you got to immerse yourself in that. And you got to have mm -hmm. the confidence that you're good enough to do it, to monetize it, to make a living that you survive. Yeah. You might not make $40 million a year doing whatever it is, but you're happy. Everything else falls into place. Yeah. Everything. And I mean, when you're happy with yourself, you're happy inside, you're happy with what you're doing, you love to get up in the morning, you don't want to go to bed at night because you like what you do, you love what you do, you are what you do, then you're successful in my opinion. I yeah. don't care how much. I mean, what we have here on, on earth is all borrowed anyways, yeah. except for what's in here. Right. And, you know, I mean, like – you can take my clothes off of me and you can have them back. You can take my pickup away from me. You can take my car away from me. You can take my truck, whatever that, whatever that is, the house. You can, somebody can physically remove that from you. They can take it away from you. But what you have in here, your experiences and what you lived and how you, you know, love life, nobody can ever take that away from you. Yeah. And so that means more to me than anything. And I think that's the cowboy. That's what cowboy life is. You know, that's what so romantic about the cowboy is because it is one of those deals where you never know what you're going to do in the morning. You never know what your day is going to be like. You never know what situations you're going to be put in. You never know what you're going to see. And you ride up over that next hill and you're like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. So cool. You know, you see something in the nature, you see something, you know, something happens that majority of people in the world don't get to, be involved with or see or even hear about right and you know that's what makes being a cowboy so romantic and always has because they're always striving to see what's over the next hill what next adventure awaits them you know yeah. and that's kind of the way i live my life so around way long story short there is no such thing as that by the way there's no long story short but uh the uh just immerse yourself in it be committed to it if you need to go find somebody that you want to work for you know, and they're like, well, you, you, everybody's still got to pay their bills. There's no doubt about it. You still have to eat. You still have to pay your bills, blah, blah, blah. But tell those people, if you're really, really, really 1,000%, that's what you want to do, tell them I work for you for a week. And then after that, you can tell me to hit the road or you can hire me, one of the two. But yeah. I'll work for you for a week for free. Yeah, I've painted a lot of walls for free. Yeah, right. You know, in yeah. the same way, like, and, like, I used to just go get on horses at – at a sale barn and be the night rider, you know, I mean, I'd go down there for $5 a ride at Cleburne at the sale barn because I was broke, but I would go get on horses and ride them through the sale for five bucks a ride, not knowing what you're going to get on, not knowing what the outcome's going to be. If they're going to buck you off in the alley, if they're going to mash you against the fence, if they're going to flip over what they're going to do, but that's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to improve my skill level. And so I did everything I could do. And if you called me and said, 
hey, we're going to brand calves tomorrow. Can you be here? I can't pay you, but can you be here? If I didn't have something else planned, I would be there. Yeah. If it cost me to go down there and get my you know, the last $20 out of my bank account to put gas in my truck to drive over there to help you brand calves, that's what I would do. I think that um, that's the caveat. You know, like that's like a prerequisite is – the the obsession you talked about the 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 work ethic so like if you're especially especially if you're going to go into something that's unique and uncommon where you are self-employed because i think it's human nature to get to a certain level you get five six hundred dollars in your pocket and then you let up right but if you're going to be successful as a cowboy as an artist as a youtuber like you have to press on you have to be you have to the, the, the work ethic that comes behind being successful is is a prerequisite. I think you have to be tenacious, you have to be um, obsessed, but you but to be successful, obviously at anything, but especially at this, right. as opposed to maybe a nine to five architect job where you can have days where you just show up yep. and go yep. through the motions and not get fired. But you also get paid accordingly. You know, and there's someone there who owns the company who doesn't do that or didn't do that and is going to get paid accordingly. Mm -hmm. And so to especially when you're getting started, you have to have just relentless work ethic. But in the very beginning, like you two just described, you have to have that creativity, you know, the sale barn thing, you know, getting on those horses as they come through five, ten dollars a ride like. You have to have that creativity of like how, what additional ways can I monetize this? Because it can't just be riding outside horses and day work. Because riding out outside horses, best case scenario, like right now, especially if you're a beginner, they're not going to pay you much at all. No. Six, five, six hundred dollars. But seven, eight, maybe a thousand dollars a month, best case scenario, you're riding a horse every single day. Um, but then day working. Maybe now, everyday price. What where the places that were paying one twenty five, maybe they're paying one fifty, one sixty five, one seventy five, one fifty, one seventy five. And but you pay, for, you blow out four dollar. Yeah, blow, blow out one tire. You that's know, two days. You, that's two days worth of work. One Just, tire is two days. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, you fill up your pickup to drive an hour to go to work. It costs you one hundred fifty bucks. You, yeah, two hundred. Mm-hmm. And so you're already in the hole when you start, you know right. I mean? When you, when you pull out that morning, you're in the hole, you're, yeah. you, you just hope to break even that day and you don't have a blowout. And so you do break even, you know, yeah. or you don't have something happen. Your horse don't get crippled. You don't have, you know, don't get bucked off and you're crippled. I mean, because all that stuff is very apt to happen and it's very apt to happen very quick. So tell me, just kind of run through the different streams of income like different ways you get paid throughout a year. Just kind of list them off for me as a cowboy. <clears throat> so as, as a cowboy, I, uh, I day work, no doubt about it. I mean, I, and, and I've limited that back to a little bit just because I'm busy with what I do and my own self. I own my own cows. Yep. I, uh, I do influencing cowboy influencing is what you said earlier, you know, um, so I worked for some different companies there. I uh, also started a coffee company with a buddy of mine that actually came to work for me on a ranch that I ran for a long time. We started a coffee company, apparel company, seven, eight years ago, Bison Union. Um, yeah, I trade horses. I trade horses. And when I say trade horses, I mean like I'll sell horses and I'll buy colts and I'll make them put my – put my knowledge on those horses and my experience and give them a, a job and something to do. And then I'll sell those horses as well. Um, and that's, you know, that's pretty much what I do. That's, um, I don't, uh, like I say, I work for my, I, I own my own cows and I don't own a whole bunch of them, but I own enough that if I don't do anything, at least I break even. Right. I mean, I can survive. Yes, sir. But every other thing is just added extra that yeah. I can put in the bank account you know if i if somebody calls me if you call me and say hey we're brandon kids at guacamole this weekend can you come yeah heck yeah and so when i come up here that's just extra income when i sell a horse that's extra income when i make a 
appearance, I guess, as an influencer, that's just extra income. You know, it's just extra income. You have to be diversified. There's no doubt about it in today's world. I think you need to be so diversified in your portfolio, whether it's investing in stocks or whether it's investing in companies or real estate, cattle, horses, but you need to be diversified because something is going to quit making money, but something yeah. is going to pick it, that, that loss up. Right. And if you only have one source of income, if something happens to that, then you're done. So, I mean, that's as a kid, as you know, whatever you're doing, but especially like if you're wanting to be a cowboy, like you've got to get creative with, with, um, how that money comes in. How have you gotten creative as an artist? Like what are some different ways that, that, that you have made money? Oh man. Um, so like, uh, Oh, well, before I get into that, I just, I was just thinking about this and I want y'all's opinion real quick and remind me that you asked me that because I don't want to lose the, I don't want to lose the thought. Um, it's just kind of interesting to me, like sitting here and everything is like so different from what each one of us do. There's like certain things that tie it together or whatever, but all of us kind of have like a very similar background. And I think a lot of that comes from the, the, the ranching and like, you kind of have to be really stubborn. No doubt. So it's like, you know, like you're talking about like, well, you're not giving up. And it's like, yeah. that's whenever I went to LA, it was kind of like just relating to that. It's like, it was like, oh no, it's this or bust. Like you said, going in right. all in just thinking about that. It was like, and even, even just being from where I'm from out of New Mexico, it's like, why do people live there? It's like the worst place on earth. Have y'all been there? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Like there's think about lots of, there's lots of pretty country in New Mexico, but there is a lot of rain, ugly country too. Yeah, right. rain, yeah. you know, it's like think about going there in like the 1800s when my grandparents or my great grandparents or great great, you know, and they show up and they're like, "This is a good place to live." <laughs> and it's like, why did you stop here? Yeah, yeah. go anywhere but here, yeah. you know, or you know. So just like thinking about that, they kind of had to be a little bit stubborn. It's like maybe it's just kind of ingrained. I don't know. But, yeah, it um, is. I think it is ingrained. You know, I mean, like I, I, you saying that makes me think back to. What do they say when you get bucked off? What do the what's get the, back on? Get back there you on. go, and that's the way cowboys grow up. When you get bucked off, you get back on, and you right. had to. Like my dad, if you got bucked off or you fell off, and even as a little kid, you know, you whack your head or hit your shoulder, break your wrist, whatever it may be, you're gonna get back on that horse to face your fears because that's where everything starts. Yeah. Is if you're scared of something, you're never going to attempt to do it. But if you understand that you can make it through that and get out the other side and you're still okay, you're not dead, well, then, like, okay, well, maybe when you do start something, you finish it. You know, no matter what, that's what you do. You That drive, that dedication, that discipline. And that's when you're taught from a little bitty kid when you're getting on them little spring bucking horses and you f get bucked off. They, oh, you got bucked off. Get back on. That's what yeah. you got to do. First thing you got to do is get back on, you know, when you right. get bucked off. And so, and that's life, you know, I mean, because you're going to get bucked off a number of times in life. And if you just give up and say, well, I can't do that. Well, it's a lot easier the next time you get bucked off to go, you know what, nah, I'm done. Yeah, okay. And sooner or later, you're going to look up and you're just going to have failure after failure after failure after failure after failure because you don't get back up and you don't get back on because it's too hard. And I think a lot of people have that mentality to, in today's world that if it's too hard, I just, I, I find some other thing to do, you know, and, the, and yeah. that's not the cowboy mentality. That's not the way we live. It's not your mentality, obviously, you know, I mean, it's, so it is, it's one of those deals where you're raised that way and they've been raised that way and they've been raised that way. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's just a, it's deep down inside your soul. Yeah. That it doesn't matter. You know I mean? Like I'm cool with sucking for right. a long time yeah. to be good. And so. and a lot of people aren't like, you know, I mean, I, I took up jujitsu trying to roll with some jujitsu guys, you know, I suck. Like right. I'm horrible at it, but I'm cool with sucking because one of these days I'm going to beat that guy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's my mentality about everything. One of these days I work hard enough at it. I'm going to beat that guy. Yeah. No matter what. I call it throwing punches. It's there like you if go. you throw in enough, like you're going to keep missing. One's going to be weak. This, that, but what, like, it's that like last, like 50th. What if it lands? Yeah. What exactly. if you knock dude out? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I don't know. But. It's kind of like that cartoon I've seen where there's two pitchers and there's two tunnels and one guy's just right to the end. They've been digging the tunnel with a pickaxe and one guy's right to the end and he's still swinging the ax and he's got this long tunnel behind him. He has no idea how much further 
it is to the gold, but he's still swinging his axe. And then you got another guy below him that is just inches away from the gold, and he's turned around with his pickaxe and right. he's walking off and because he's a, been digging so long. He's like wore out. He's like, I'm never going to get to the end. I'm never going to see any success, and so I'm just quitting. And it doesn't matter. Just keep grinding, grinding. That's why. Grinding. That's why it's hard for me to like. Like I don't ever like tell somebody here what to do with 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 an event with a thing like I tell them the challenges they're that I think they're gonna face but like you know if somebody sucks at an event you know because rough stock it's really hard to learn you got to get control of your emotions <laughs> you have to execute the fundamentals and then it's also dangerous and so um bull riding bareback saddle bronc whatever it is like the very next one might be the one right you know it may take 200 more. Right. Yep. And in that, within those 200, you go broke and your family exiles you. And then, you and know, you, like maybe you some bad broke. things happen. <laughs> yeah. or, or it's like five away. And so, like, I'm never one to tell somebody you shouldn't even try it or you shouldn't do it. But I, I will be downright honest with the the, the dangers and, and not only the physical dangers, but also just, you know, um, the financial dangers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Fin but financial yeah go back to that yeah uh, let's go yeah. back to that you asked me a question i didn't want to be rude i just knew that i would yeah, lose yeah, yeah. i would completely lose it if right 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 i understand i got like add adhd cnn <laughs> tbs cnn yeah. hb whatever all of the letters i know mm -hmm. i got them so I, I jump um but but uh the multiple streams of income thing uh uh it's it's I figured that out from like selling a painting. Like if I sell a painting, it's it's gone. And if it's priced too low, then it's like diminishing returns. It's like I spent a month on this thing. Well, if I charge three thousand dollars, it's like, well, what do you get paid hour? You're like making so much below minimum wage, you know, bills, this, that, and like if I spend that much time or whatever, it's like, okay, so you gotta charge more than that. Um and that gets weird in the art game anyway, uh, because you never really know. Y your price really isn't determined by you. It's more determined by, like, collectors, who has your work. It, get, it gets into this whole weird kind of slimy mess that I don't even, I don't even like going into. Um, but, like, so, so I was like, okay, whenever I first did it, it was like, all right, I'll sell a painting, sell a painting. It's like, well, I spent a month on that. I'm broke. I'm beyond broke. So it's like, okay, up the price. Well, now I can do, I can just sell that one or I can make prints of that one and sell like an edition of 50 signed and numbered. Most of the time those go for like, for me right now, um, it depends on the print, but they go from like 175 a print basically to like all the way up to like 700 depending on like the size or whatever. And the upper range of that, I'll like hand embellish them with gold. So every single print is different even though it's like a copy of a painting that i did it's like every single one is hand done there's like a little something on it so it's like well okay well i'm selling the same thing to different margins of people yeah you know it's like uh yeah. it's like well not everybody can afford a ten thousand dollar painting but you know maybe they could swing 175 bucks for a print same size it's on paper you get a nice frame it looks like really cool and it's never going to be reproduced. It's like you have a certain number of these things. So it's like you sell. So I, I, I do things like that, like selling a painting more than one time and, and not, you know, like literally, but in, in those terms. And then um, and then uh, for, for me, murals has been really cool, like having that graffiti background and being able to apply that to kind of like commercial or personal murals. Like I, I've, I have the coolest job in the world now because like people will reach out and just say, like, we love your work. Here's our budget. Come paint this twenty-story building. Yeah. Did you paint the one in Amarillo of him? Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. I'm kidding. How did? Yeah. So I'm gonna jump around over here and like I'm gonna take over your show a little bit, Dale. Um, how did y'all meet? Like, how did that connection ever come about? Um. So it was a dark club. Man, he with some <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was following me, and. Like in a pickup or yeah 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 at dark, night dark club yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and I just every now and then whenever I was like watching my story for some reason for whatever reason you know this there's no way that this isn't gonna sound arrogant but like 
whenever <laughs> you sound if you arrogant, have a bunch of followers, <laughs> you don't get to see. You know, it just shows you like a hundred of maybe like twenty thousand right. likes. You know what I mean? You don't. Yeah, yeah. You don't have time. To I mean, I don't have that many followers, but yeah, I, I mean, so I, I, I'm feeling what you're saying. But like his um, profile picture kept popping up on my like I would just go glance at my story and uh, check the analytics of different things for whatever reason. And it would show like the top, you know, it would show three people that watched it. And then you swipe up and it'll show you like 20 people that out of the however many thousands that have watched the story. And there was always this painted profile deal. And I saw it like half a dozen times. And I was like, I just had to click on it. And then I saw all this art, his art. And I've just, I don't know, it just resonated. Like yeah. whatever term you want to use for the art world, it was just like it spoke to me. There you go. <laughs> His <Yeah>. art spoke <laughs> to me, and it told me to hit the follow button. Right on. And uh, so I did, and then um, I think I might have commented on some stuff and started liking some stuff, and then you said, like, hey, man, one of us spoke spoke to the other one. for I don't remember how it went, and then you offered to come do – you was like, man, I'd love to come do a mural sometime. And then, um, yeah, the Netflix show was coming up, and so you came down – hung out you did this mural during the netflix show the scene it was going to be hilarious did it make it i think it made it. i don't know if it did i i, I figured that i would what do you, what do you, you mean maybe. you didn't you didn't watch it you didn't watch Wait, it was netflix? for it was for you had a netflix show <laughs> yeah <laughs> no so, no um, so like we go in the warehouse really? we're in the where for those of you that don't know there's a huge mural of me <laughs> in my warehouse but like so the camera comes in and you can't see the mural, and it's me talking to him. like, I'm Dale Brisby. This is my warehouse. And, um, you know, I say something like, world's greatest bull rider, also the most humble. And then the camera cuts, <laughs> changes, and it's Drew painting a life, you know, <laughs> larger-than-life mural of me uh -huh. on the wall, right? After on I a talk about being garage humble. door, like a big a roll-up garage, garage door. Yeah, yeah it's like not just 14 a life. feet tall Like, mural. it is like 12 <laughs> times bigger than, yeah. yeah. And it's me holding my fist out, you know. <laughs> and I was like, I use this to encourage my employees. So, so anyways, yeah. He, but he. And it's great. It's a great painting. Man. He I had been him. interested in my. I was confused as to why he's following me, and even at the time, like there wasn't a lot of like ranching content you had on your page, Drew. But like, yeah. I was like, man, I wonder why this guy's interested in what right. I'm doing, you know. And um, you know, turns out he had a ranching background, came from that, but had been in L.A. doing murals and paintings for 10 years and so i was intrigued by his art he liked my ranching skit and video type mm -hmm. content and um so yeah fell in love and here we are oh, here we are so no, <laughs> so no he did a mural here and then did one at the ranch that that skull on rodeo blues oh yeah oh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, so yeah yeah we, he did both of those that trip cool and um and so now he's back and we we would be painting today, but it's raining, so yeah. we decided to make best use of our time, and it'd be hot. I say we. He would be painting he, today, he. <laughs> but he's going to do a mural on the very front. Awesome. So this the Dale Warehouse is open to the public, but nobody knows what this is. It's just a warehouse in right. a part of a town in West Texas. So, like, it's just he's going to put a Rodeo Time, the logo, Ooh, on the front. you're putting the Rodeo Time logo? On that big, on that big. This, uh, this one? This Rodeo Time logo? No, the one on Willie's. With the skull, the skull that'll be really the cool. original yeah. actual trademark, Heck yeah. and um, so that'll go on the front deal, and um, we'll just play it by ear for what what we have time for after that. Heck yeah, I but felt like it was it was kind of like a cool organic. I, I don't know because it, it was it was cool to see what you were doing because it was so um, it was like I was like kind of just watching it in real time, like just grow mm -hmm. and grow and yeah. grow. And it was it was interesting for me because it goes back to that just like man just just be yourself like it's yeah. it's okay like yeah. but you know L A in general and art world it's like man I, I it was like kind of like tiptoeing on eggshells out there it was like oh so like you know where do you come from there oh like what's your family do it's it's like well we raise beef cattle and then it was like record skips what? like you do what yeah murderer. Yeah, you know what I mean. Probably a lot of vegans out there. A lot of vegans. I dated oh. a few vegans. <laughs> it was interesting. <laughs> I bet that was I, coming from. It was just like, when do they find 
All I really yeah. consume yeah. are vegans. So exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually, I'm the opposite of a vegan. I'm on the carnivore diet. I'm eating no vegetables. I eat processed vegetables, mm-hmm. vegetables that have been eaten by other animals. That's how I like my vegetables. There you go. Through a beef. There you go. And exactly. I will eat, right I will eat with you. in, uh, but yeah. Exactly. That, but the, and, and, you know, having said that, no hate. Like, right. I, I know a few people, you know, dietary stuff, whatever, like it works. Like, I, oh, man, I did a, a, a residency. Oh, yeah. And no, uh, I'm not hating oh. either. All I'm saying is I, I can appreciate that conversation that you described. It's, like, it's when touchy, you come man. across, <laughs> because there is hate. From some of those people towards us, where right. it is, you know, I'm it not, doesn't I don't hate you for being, you yeah, know, eat, eat whatever you want, even like, though yeah. those plants probably have feelings too. But, yeah. but, but anyway, whatever. Or they're Le- using fertilizer from our cattle, whatever. It, that's a whole other, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. that rabbit that they shot out of the field that where they grew your lettuce. Yeah. Because <laughs> right. if they don't, then your lettuce that is, doesn't get to the store. It's nine rabbits to eat an acre, I think. Yeah, like that. exactly. Yeah. So you know how many, yeah. Anyway, it's a yeah. whole circle. Get off that. that. We'll get off yeah, that. But, yeah, uh, but, oh, so <laughs> I, I did this uh, this residency a few years ago um, with Red Bull in Detroit. They have the, har- the House of Art up there. And both of the guys in there were uh, vegan, vegetarian. One guy was a vegan, a th- a vegan, and I think the other guy was a vegetarian. I thought they were both vegan. And me being like, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll try this. I got, I got nothing again. I'll try it. Like, I'll, I'll go with you guys because we'd go to the grocery store together. We were always like living with these two other artists, phenomenal artists, uh, Ian and Michael. So like, we would go to the grocery store, and I was like, I'll try to do this with you. After like a week, man, I was dying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just like I was like I was tired. I felt terrible. Whatever. And then I'm not going to say names, but I see one of the dudes up in there, like, scrambling up some eggs one morning. I was like, whoa, 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 wouldn't it, wouldn't it? And he's like, oh, yeah, my body, sometimes I can't. It's like, you know, and I was like, <laughs> dude, why didn't you tell me? I'm over here, like, like the walking dead every day. <laughs> Man, I'm the opposite. I started, I've been 24 days on the carnivore diet, and I got more energy than I know what to do with. I'd like to try that one. Yeah. yeah. It's, it seems like you, a lot of work. Uh, not really. If you go, I, I actually am hungry less and I eat less. So I mean, there's certain days like you work your tail off or whatever. You go on a eight mile run, like you're gonna be hungry no matter what right. diet you're on or whatever you're eating. But but for the most part, like I, I, I feel like I eat less at meals and I'm actually and I'm less hungry. But you know, if you go really strict on if you do a lot a lot of beef the first two weeks, you're gonna like have some pretty explosive diarrhea but <laughs> you get used to it and then but there's all kind of like Jordan Peterson and his daughter Michaela like they were advocates of it and like they uh it's like helping cured their psoriasis and there's this autoimmune diseases that they have that it just like completely you know eradicated all their symptoms but I'm getting my blood tested Tuesday the 31st so I'm anxious to see what that says because I've I've had high cholesterol before, but I'm I'm really suspecting that it's not out of control. I bet it's not too high, but I, I'll report back to you guys. Yeah, we will. American know. Yeah. the American Heart Association. They didn't make an announcement about this, but I I was listening to this one podcast. This uh, this guy that was follows the American Heart Association. They removed the maximum requirements of cholesterol intake so like they used to have like a recommended like don't eat over this much cholesterol in a diet per day right and they removed i think i'm wording that right like i just listened to it but they removed that requirement also for saturated fats because there was no proof that that's what caused heart disease gotcha so like it's always been a hypothesis people think that a lot of beef <clears throat> and saturated fat cause heart disease. Like a lot of people think that. Your hairdresser, your mom. That's a, that's always what I've heard. But there's no, but apparently there's no like hardcore data evidence. Like it's a hypothesis. Mm. They think that, but apparently it's not like a, and then Michaela, Michaela Peterson, Jordan Peterson's daughter, she's been on only beef, water, and salt, sometimes lamb for five years. And a She's not unhealthy. She's actually the opposite. It's like cured all these things that was wrong with her. <laughs> Crazy. It's awesome. 
So Almost. daddy's going to try it, but she's on the lion diet. I'm doing the carnivore diet, which is I'll also, you know, pretty much anything that it, from like an animal. So like fish and chicken and but I, but mostly right now it's just beef. Like my last 3 meals have been beef. And then I've I've have also had some eggs. Man, I got to get it together. You can also I'm have butter on it. <laughs> but and then every now and then for dessert, like I'll have like I'll dip my spoon in a jar full of like honey, homemade honey. And uh, which comes from bees, <laughs> not plants. So, but I haven't cheated. It's been 24 days. So it's good. When I fr I did have one salad like on January 3rd or something. That was the last vegetable I had. It was three weeks ago. But w where was that in like relative? Like how long had you been on the diet? Whenever you had the salad, did it mess you up, or were you like? No, it didn't mess me up. I mean, I didn't have any dressing on it. It was just oh, a salad. Right. It was just like lettuce. But like, um, um. I had started like a week before New Year's Eve because Cameron Haynes made this post. He was just like, "Don't wait till January 1st. You, and yeah. <laughs> so. I can't. I can't listen to those guys, or else I just feel, dude. You want to talk about feel? So like, I'm going to be on his podcast next month. Oh, sick. but I'm there for two days, so oh, I'll run no. with him for a day. Why I'll would work you do out that? with him? Then I go on the podcast. Why would you do that? I don't know, but. So I've been running a lot harder in anticipation for this, you know, workout with this ultra marathon runner. He runs 140 mile races sometimes. Yeah. One time he ran a 240 mile race. Get the hell out of here. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't, I don't even want to drive that far. Yeah, horses mm -hmm. for that. He ran it. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, he goes, uh, he, so I'm getting ready. Like I've been pounding pavement and not pavement, dirt road, tack road. That's my, that's my joint. <laughs> but, um. So, man, my hip started, like, getting sore. And I heard David Goggins talk about that. Like, of course, he was running way harder than I was. But, like, his hip just finally got to where he had to, and like, so as I'm doing all this. So, I <laughs> one day I'm just like, every now and then Cam will respond to my DM. So, I was like, I'm just going to DM and ask him, like, hey, is this normal? And he was like, yeah, it's pretty normal, but um, it's all mental. <laughs> it's like, dang, oh. man. <laughs> I was like, I knew, and I knew it too. I was yeah, like, he's yeah. going to have a man, like an alpha male response. Uh, yeah. And, you know, he's, and, and I was just like, it is all mental. So, anyways, I've been stretching it. And is I, it, is it like right here? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. I, I got that from paint murals. Uh, there's certain <laughs> postures that you can take on like that whenever, will cause it. Yeah. Your like, hip, the way your hips are rotated. And um, I'm right-handed, so it's like whenever I stand, I'm at an angle, and then, like, the way my legs are shifted, like, one is up, I put all my weight, and I couldn't figure out what it was, and then I started looking stuff up. It was like whenever you're painting, like, 20 hours a day, standing on just, like, concrete platform, you're yeah, up yeah, yeah. and down so ladders, like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's like a, I'm sure that's like, you know, there's, and there's probably something in my day-to-day, -day, obviously, that caused it, you know, but, like, um. Anyway, well, with with you, there's so many things. So I'm like, like two and a half weeks, I'm two and a half weeks away from going to be with him, and and sh of course I've got this now this thing in my head. Of course, right before I go, but I don't know how much would I learn if I went up there with completely healthy, you know. Right. So right. yeah. Well, what sucks is like you can't with them and like Goggins and those guys. You can't be like, oh, well, I've had like a thing. No <laughs> kidding. Yeah, it's like. Oh, my hip kind of hurts. Can't, yeah, I don't feel like running ankle today. A couple of days ago, <laughs> you know. Their feet are bleeding. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Just running on bloody nubs. He'll uh, usually put like his miles every day, and it's like 14, 15, 18, 26, like every day. Like he'll, he'll get up and run eight. He'll take at lunch break, he'll go 10 or 12. Then at night, after everybody goes to sleep, he'll go 10 or 12 more. And he's like, and then, and he said it the other day, he was just like, Everybody's asleep at your house right now. What's your excuse? And I was like, dang. Because everybody in my house was mm -hmm. asleep. And I was like, yep. I didn't go run, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody I'm, is asleep. So I'm going to go in here and uh, watch a little TV when it's yeah. real quiet. I'm going to pretend like I didn't yeah. see this. I drink was, a cup of coffee and watch the yeah. news. Yeah. yeah. I was listening to a couple of their things and like. It is. It's so like it's like man. I really got to get it together. You know what I mean? Like like diet wise, whatever. I'm I'm an artist, so it's like it's just so time consuming. It's like all I do is paint. I wake up, 
cup of coffee, skip meals. Like it's the most un. And then and then even whenever like I do, it's like fast food diet. Grab something, go. Like it's just constantly like on the move and convenient. Yeah. But it hurts. Everything yeah. hurts, and it's right. like I, I know that like like they just break through, just do it right, like whatever. Yeah. And it will get better. It's like your diet and stuff. It's like it's gonna get better. Yeah. But it's yeah. like. Ugh. I'm still on that self-destructive thing. That's the hardest <laughs> thing. Don't worry about that. Well, I talked about it on the a couple of podcasts back, but comparatively speaking for what I previously, the the seriousness that I did previously take my health and wellness, now I would, compa- comparatively speaking, I would say I'm obsessed. Mm. Um, not compared to Cam Haynes, but compared to what I was like two years ago, just because – my old man dies of a heart attack at 55. After Netflix, they're like, you got medication-worthy cholesterol. Yeah. And so it, then it's like, okay, like, it, it put a timeline on it. Like, that means yeah. at 55, like, that's my year. This is my flesh and blood. Came straight out of this man. I'm on the exact same path as him. I got X amount of years left. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And and mm-hmm. it made it so real. And I thought, what if, what if? I just took everything really serious and to the next level. So, like, run every day and then find find some nutrition that, like, works. And um, which that's why I'm anxious to get my blood checked because the doctors say stay away from butter, salt, eggs, shrimp, steak. <laughs> that's, like, the, the, the five anything. things. That's all I eat now. <laughs> <laughs> but like I I'm said, I'm interested to see too. That was like a hypothesis. It. It's the 31st. It's like two weeks. Yeah. I'll let you know because like I'm, I'm gonna be laughing if that stock's like, well, whatever you're doing, keep it up. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Exactly. So exactly. But maybe he doesn't, and I'll go back to the drawing board. Yeah. But I, I have a sneaky feeling that because I feel better than I ever have. That's awesome. Except for this hip. I'm gonna get this hip deal yeah. figured out. Yeah. So. It's those. It's it's like a weird annoying thing because I think I have the same. It changes the way you walk just a smidge. Mm-hmm. Like it. It's it's you can forget about it for thirty forty minutes, but it's just like a numb constant there. Anyway, it's annoying. Well, Cam Haynes would say, "Toughen up, Buttercup," because it's mental. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you brought it up earlier, but like for those of you that don't, that are listening and not just watching, Buster Frierson is a large man. He's not, like, taller necessarily than, you know. It's hard to describe him because I bet your weight – how much do you weigh? I walk around about 230. Yeah, that's – okay, well, that's actually even – but not fat. Like, not a fat 230. What are you, like, six foot? Six, six, six for one, yeah. Six one? Yeah. 230, six one, but, like – a lot of people, not me, I mean, you know, not me, but a lot of people very intimidated <laughs> by Buster Frierson. But how often do you choke slam someone? I, you know, I hadn't choke slammed anybody in a pretty long while. Like. When was the last time you had a physical altercation? <sighs> Probably 12, 14 years ago. I would say. So whenever you said earlier about the, you know, it took you to a lot of places you didn't like, were there times then where there were physical altercations? Oh, yeah. I mean, that was kind of where it was, you know. I mean, I was drinking real heavy. I was going to places that I shouldn't be. And, of course, you're going to get in situations that you don't need to be in. And then when you get in those situations and you have been drinking, it it alters your mind. It alters your, you know, your aggressive. It takes everything, makes everything different. Is there anything, is there any story that stands out that you've told before? <laughs> About an altercation? Yeah. <laughs> well, so yeah, this, I guess, is, is a pretty good one. I actually um, got into an altercation with a guy at a birthday party. And uh, it was over. It wasn't his birthday party. No, it was not okay. his birthday okay. party. Okay, you had uh, two seconds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, we had. Me and another buddy of mine had bought a keg for the birthday party. And so we put it in the kitchen like we do, you know, and it's in there. And there's red Solo cups in there. And we had a pickle jar. And you put $5 in the pickle jar or $10 or whatever it was. You can drink all the beers that you want, whatever. Well, these three big guys come in. And 
I don't know who they are. And there's one or two people in there that understood and knew who they were, you know, and well, I'm in there having a good time intoxicated, you know, not to the point where I'm falling down drunk, but I was feeling pretty good. And, uh, my buddy comes in there and he says, Hey, these three guys out here. And he was a little guy, you know, he's these three guys out here. They, they've been drinking our beer and they, and they ain't put no money in a pickle jar. Give me out of that pickle jar, you know. And so I grab the pickle jar and I stick my hand in the top of the pickle jar. It's a big pickle jar, like a gallon pickle jar. And I walk in there and I find the biggest guy that he's pointed out between these three guys. I pick the biggest one out, walk right up to him, and I said, uh, hey, man, glad you're here. Hope you have fun and drink all the beer you want. But if y'all don't mind, put a little money in the pickle jar to help pay for the keg. He said, yeah, I'll pay for it when I leave kind of looked down at me he was probably a couple three inches taller than me two to three inches taller than me about my same size big guy <clears throat> and i said well i guess you're leaving now and he said no nah, i don't think so i said uh yeah i think so i said either put five dollars in the pickle jar or get out of here and i of course i could i knew it was coming you know i mean yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it's coming and, uh, Before you picked up the jar to walk over there, yeah, you probably it, it had knew a pretty it was good coming. idea. Something was going to happen, you know. And yeah. so, and I said, uh, you know, I don't know what what transpired. There was probably a few cuss words, and we kind of got a little closer together, and we, you know, trying to bow up, however you want to do it, trying to intimidate the other one into backing down, and neither one of us did. And uh, so I kind of bumped him in the chest with the pickle jar. And when I bumped him in the chest with a pickle jar, he hit me right there. And, I mean, it was, like, very – like, he knew what he was going to do just as well. Like, I was kind of dumb because I had the pickle jar, but it wasn't a very good situation for me at that time. But when he hit me, I kind of went backwards and went over a recliner, and then here he came, and we wrestled around, fought, threw a few punches right there. I kind of got on top of him, whacked him a couple times, blah, blah, blah. They broke it up. Some people inside the party broke it up. I went around that back side of the, it was at an apartment complex, and we went around, I went around the apartment, and everybody was trying to get me to calm down. Well, they went out the front door, and, you know, everybody, have how it happens when a fight altercation breaks out, everybody stirred up. And so I'd kind of calmed down a little bit and was like, yeah, it's kind of ha-ha, funny, funny deal, you know. I and mean, did they leave? And they're like, no, they're still out front. And so I walked around the back and was coming up the sidewalk, and I heard him say, you tell that blankety-blank cowboy to come back out here. I ain't done with him. I just walked right up behind him. Another dumb move on my part at that time. Like you say, I was intoxicated, so I wasn't thinking real well. I thought I was a lot tougher than what I was, but – as he said that, I told him, I said, you ain't got to tell, nobody's got to tell me, here I am, what you got to say, and he wheels around with a big right hook, and I'm talking about whacks me right there as hard as he can hit me, knocks me over some shrubs, almost knocked me out, and I think he thought he knocked me out, and this kind of goes back to that deal growing up as a cowboy, you get back home when you get bucked off kind of type deal, where he thought he knocked me out, I fell over <laughs> in behind some shrubs, and, and maybe I was, you know, cold cock for just a split second you know but when i got my rights and got my bearings back about me i come out of the bushes like a mad bull and me and him went at it and like we went at it for a pretty good while um they finally kind of broke it up and he was done i got up and walked off and bled around for a little while like it was one of them good ones like we fought for a pretty good minute you Dang. know and as uh it was like two bulls going at it but ended up he didn't have to pay for the beer i was about to say dude. and <laughs> i had a big black eye and a couple of busted lips and nose was bleeding you know kind of you know you don't ever win in a fight i did right, figure right, that right. out but mm -hmm. i tried to do a lot figure it you know like i'm gonna win one of these one of these days man i thought I, I just I applaud you for picking a story where you 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 didn't come out like a knight in shining armor. No, no, no. That dude freaking. That's the hardest I ever been hit. Like he, when he hit me that second time. The first time was just kind of a real short jab, glancing kind of like yeah. when I bumped him, he just kind of went from his elbow to the end of his hand, you know, and yeah. hit me in the jaw. That second one where he hit me right there, it. 
Like, it came from way back yonder, and he had wound it up. And, I mean, when he hit me, it felt like you hit me with a baseball bat. And I went head over heels right in the bushes. And, uh, you know, like I said, nobody comes out of winter on that deal. I was beat up. He was beat up. He just he quit before I did. And and everybody, it was pretty cool, too, because everybody kind of just, like, nobody jumped in. It wasn't that yeah. BS where – I was having to fight two or three different guys. It was just me and him, mano y mano, and everybody was like, y'all figure it out, settle it, and we'll, yeah. we'll be done. And when we got done, it was, whew, I hurt for probably a week and a half after that. Like, I hurt. I mean, like, yeah. it, it hurts. I guess I've always been, like, a little hesitant. Not hesitant, but, like, I guess I feel like I'm jumping in for with any – Friend, but I, I I feel like there's a li- it's a little different if you like you see a friend headed somewhere and that friend wants to fight for instance over five dollars yeah you yeah, know right. what I mean <laughs> like that's like I can see how maybe that would lead to these two are fighting for a time one on one. And then there needs to be some sort of unique way where it's broken up where they don't kill each other. Yeah. But I just, I guess I just, assuming that my friend with me does not want to fight, which if they're my friend, then that's probably where they're at. Like, I just, I don't roll with a lot of guys who just, no offense, get drunk and want to fight. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I'm probably, that kind of person is probably not. And I'll throw this out there too that I've been sober for 20, Right, yeah. 20, 21 knew, years. So, but if I, I mean, was, it's been a pretty good while since that was one of the altercations. Like I say, that one 12 or 14 years ago, I don't know, it's probably 12 years ago. It, I was sober, like stone cold sober, and I tried to avoid it and avoid it and avoid it and avoid it. And, like, I told the guy, look, man, you're drunk. You don't want to do this. I promise you because I am the only sober guy in here. I said, everybody else has been drinking. I'm the only sober guy in here. You don't want – and, like, he had a – he, it was over. He didn't like me because I walked into the place. Yeah. I mean, there was nothing other than the fact that I was a big guy and I walked into the place and he saw me and he was like, that's who I'm going to yeah, whip yeah, tonight. Yeah, 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 And, did you he, know, he, he told, done? no, no, not at all. Not <laughs> even freaking close. Like he was to the point where he tried to hit me with a beer bottle. We were in yeah. a bar. He tried to hit me with a beer bottle, and I took it out of his hand as he was. I mean, that's how intoxicated he was. Like, it was so obvious what he was fixing to do that I reached and took it out of his hand like you would a five-year-old taking their rattler out of their, you know, yeah, a bottle out of their hand. It was like I took it out of his hand, and I set it down, and I'm like, man, I told you you don't want to do this. I gave him another opportunity after he tried to hit me with a beer bottle. Yeah. And I'm just like, dude, you don't want to do this. Like, yeah. I'm telling you, I am. And finally, I was like, all right, let's go. Let's go right out the back door. There's an alley right there. I've been in this bar a long, I mean, I've been around in a long time. There's an alley right there. Nobody's around. Let's go. Let's walk out the door. I said, I promise you, one of us is going to come back in here, and that one of us is not you. Yeah. I'm giving you, like, I gave you every opportunity, and it was a one-two deal, and he was couldn't even stand up, you know. It was like I didn't you even. Punched him in the jaw. Pop, pop, and it was done, and I turned around went back in. That was it. Yeah, but you he know. was probably, like, a lot, like, smaller than me, probably. Uh, no, I mean, he was, you know, I mean, you're a pretty good-sized guy. Yeah, he yeah, your yeah. Size. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was yeah. just checking. <laughs> yeah. No, see, like, something like that, it's like, if whoever's with that guy, I guess I've just imagined, like, if I'm with somebody who does not want to fight, Yeah, I don't feel like, I feel like, like I have a responsibility that they should not be left alone right. to, you know, like, I would have to, like, all right, we're both, you know, and if there's two of them, like, obviously, like, I'm going to have to, we're going to, it's going to be now it's two on two because I'm not right. going to just let you get beat up by this one guy, but then his friend's not going to like it right. anyway. I, I I don't know. I try to stay away from I, that that's nowadays. Me, man. Like, hey, man, it's that's not worth me. it, and and I'm damn sure not advocating Well, I fighting, also, I watch, know? I follow this guy on Instagram. His name's, uh, I don't, I can't remember his name, but his Instagram handle is Carry Trainer, C-A-R-R-Y Trainer, T-R-A-I-N-E-R. Anyway, he, f- he's one of those guys, he's kind of like Mike Glover, where they, they talk about, like, be your own Calvary. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, nobody's coming to save you. Right. And so it's a lot of, 
not just self defense, but everyday carry stuff, you know, right. handguns, knives, like et cetera, like what's in your pack and just be your own cavalry kind right. of deal, you know. And they got first aid kits in their pickup, the kind of stuff that I need to do, but just haven't been disciplined enough to do it. But mm-hmm. anyways, he'll always this carry trainer, he'll always share like like videos of just like he shared one yesterday. It was a guy on a subway and this uh this one guy didn't like the way this guy was sitting next to him, and he stood up and pulled out some scissors. And the guy sitting next to him stood up, and I mean clocked this guy. He hit him twice, but you could tell after the first one, he folded like a cheap chair and just went no bones and knocked out cold. Mm-hmm. His blood starts coming out his nose, a very light snore. <laughs> and the guy just walks away. And the guy knocked out was the one that started it, but it would just, it happened so fast. And it's just, I don't know. As a young adult male, I remember times going into a bar and having that feeling of like that I should have my chest bowed out Mm -hmm. and um, assessing, all right, I know I could whoop these seven guys. (laughs) This guy's going to give me a run for my money. You know what I mean? Like just like a guy thing. Yeah. You know? And for some reason in college, I was walking, you know, I had a buddy, he and I walked to and from class together. And I don't know why this incident changed that mentality about me that I just described, but I'm walking and he's having a bad day and we walked to class every day together and, um, we were neighbors and, um, our dads knew each other from high school, but, but, but he and I weren't best friends by any means, but he was my friend and, uh, he was having a rough day and didn't talk much on our walk. And, uh, anyhow, that evening he went home and committed suicide. Oh. Mm. And, um, I don't know. I have no idea why, but like that shook me in that point in my life. And, um, I, I felt like I should, I could have been more. I didn't blame myself. I didn't stay up all night. Like I had one interaction per week in college with this gentleman, with this buddy of mine, and it was that walk to and from that one class that we had together, and um, just our schedules lined up. And uh, but we had kind of, I'd known him growing up, just know of it. So, anyways, I didn't blame myself, but I thought, man, I probably could have acted a di- that I could have done something. Mm. Not blaming myself, but, like, what if I had, like, hey, man, what's bothering you today? Or even a step further, like, hey, let's go hang out after class. What if we do this? You know, like, just, yeah. like, but I was probably in my own world thinking of my girlfriend at the time or rodeo or whatever. And it was like a light switch because the next day I went to a rodeo, and it was actually it was a college rodeo, and um, we did go to a bar. And I just remember just – like looking at this person like, dude, this person could be my next friend who I need to be an influence for rather mm-hmm. than can I beat you up. Right. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. That's a, that's it a was really a weird way, but like, like, dude, God used that thing in my life and it you wouldn't expect it because it had nothing to do with fighting. Right. Like I would have yeah. never yeah. fought this guy and he was not the fighting. It had nothing to do, but that's how that impacted me. Maybe because of the timing of my life. And, dude, ever since then, and, and not that even before then, I was a fighter. I just felt that guy rush of, you know, like manly, tough, right. prideful yep. ego. I'll, I can beat this guy up. So, like, that's, that's – it's real interesting that you say that, though, like that. Because, um, like, I've, I've been that guy that's, like, that's, like, just had that awful – terrible time you know whenever you can just kind of tell like there's just something you can like walk up to somebody and if they start talking trash and it's like oh this isn't me this has nothing to do with me i'm just i just happen to be in proximity of that guy right it he's aiming at whatever and i'm just there because i've been that guy and like so man i don't even know if i should tell this uh here's here's your here's your plug for the podcast so I chased this guy down Sunset in Los Angeles with an axe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so so like this is this is my this was my wake up, and and like it's just and I'm not big I'm not like this like tough guy or like whatever but like I'm I'm a painter I'm very like patient I've just always been like quiet patient like whatever whatever but like 
years of being pissed off without doing anything about it with that like that builds up yeah. and then you go through those like really like weird tough times in your life and it just like <laughs> unloads unloads and that's kind of always how i've been like in any fight that i've ever been in there was never like bowing up or talking trash i was like laughing up until the point it was just like and then on it but so uh i was going through this like terrible thing and i was living in la and i was like you know what i'm just going to I'm just going to go out. I'm going to have like a, a good thing by myself. I'm just going to drive to my favorite Thai place in L.A. on sunset. I'm going to call, get takeout. I'm going to go home. I'm going to watch some Vikings. <laughs> yeah. Just like, like whatever. I'm going to get over this. I'm going to spend a week in bed just being depressed, bounce back. And, dude, it's just so funny how like on those things you're like a magnet for any sort of bad stuff. Because, like, the whole week, there was, like, more than than this instance. There was, like, a few other things that happened. But it was just, like, this one week. But this was, like, the wake-up call. It was, like, wow, that could have went completely different. So I pull up to this Thai food spot. I'm going to – I'm sitting there on my phone. I'm, like, looking at some some stuff that I shouldn't be looking at. Just at that moment, I see, like, these suspicions or whatever, like, just brewing up. And I see this, like, thing that, like, my – I shouldn't, I should not have, and it just, like, this wave of, like, anxiety and pissed off and depression, you know, all those, like, terrible things, and at this very moment, this, like, big old, like, I don't know what he was on, but this big old dude is, like, starts banging on my window, LA, it's, it's a circus, especially in, in Hollywood, but he's banging on my window, and he's, like, doing stuff, and I'm, like, looking at him, I'm, like, go, just go away, get, just go away, whatever, whatever. And I'm like, he kind of starts walking off. And I'm like, all right. So I, I start getting out of my car. Uh, precursor, my brother always gives me great Christmas presents. So he gave me this, like, sweet double-sided axe that I'm in Hollywood. I keep it in the back of my car <laughs> for occasions just like this. <laughs> so this dude's walking out, and I start getting out of my car. And dude turns around and opens up my car door and gets in my car and closes the door. And I just, like, open up my back seat, grab my axe, walk around, open my door up, grab dude, and he starts trying to, like, whatever. And I'm just, like, I'm just going to, like, murder this guy real quick. (laughs) So, like, raise his axe, and his face just, and he just, like, darts. And, 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 you know, like, a normal person in their sane mind would be, like, okay, I scared him off. I wasn't actually. But, like, being in that, like, really. Oh, yeah, adrenaline going. Yeah. I just straight up chased this dude for a few blocks <laughs> down Sunset with a with a knife or I, I mean an axe. So I'm like chasing him down there, and I'm just like after a while, it's just like you know you're breathing hard. It's like oh, whatever. I like walk back and I'm like not thinking, and I didn't realize that there is a valet dude <laughs> right there watching the whole thing. watching the whole thing. And I'm walking up the valet dude's like he's just like, are you okay? I was like <laughs> not really. <laughs> <laughs> And I go in, I get my Thai food, I walk back out, I drive home, like, whatever, and I wake up the next day, and I was like, that could have went yeah. so much worse. Thank goodness he's so fast. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. Yeah. I don't know what he was on, man. Like, and that's something, too, that it's like, it's like I should have, like, like yeah. a sane, normal person would realize, like, this well, dude. Well, that's, that's what he went home and told his people. was like, I don't know what that dude was on, yeah. but he grabbed an axe and chased me down <laughs> Sunset Boulevard screaming yeah. at me. Well, this, yeah. like, this <laughs> like, like carry trainer guy, like, he breaks down situations, and there's, like, security footage of all kinds of stuff where, and there's a lot of, like, hero stories where just, you know, a bad guy's trying to do something, and then a good guy stops him, and he would break stuff down. And obviously in that story, he'd be like, when you're running towards a guy, be like, yeah, this, is "This is where you this need is to stop," wrong. you know. Yeah, yeah. But um, I mean, what well, y- you're probably obviously pissed off that this guy's trying to steal your car. I, I mean, that's, yeah, that's what it is. That's, like you're just like any sane person. There's yes, a so sane person. many levels, but obviously le- I wasn't. I will say this: I think a level-headed person who's calm in that moment knows not to chase him. Any sane person is gonna be pissed off, and you're in oh, the yeah. fight. It's hard to draw that line of like, okay, this is where the jury is on his side. Yeah, yeah, you know exactly. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was just a very strange thing. When you're watching the movie unfold, <laughs> it's obvious. When you're exactly. in the movie, it yeah. ain't so obvious, I and, bet. Well, that's, and you wake up the next day and you're like, 
did that just happen? Yeah. <laughs> like it, like you're so far removed, you know, like, especially well, like with like a party or like whatever, and you're drunk and you get in this big fight and you wake up the next day and you're like, did that just happen? And then you're yeah. like, yeah, yeah happened. that, that happened. That well, happened. that's what, that's what, um, that's, that's what I just, I want to be prepared for. I want to be a, prepared to like find a situation to like walk out of like, so like your situation, even with the guys like relentless, like, so my solution to that was like, I'm probably just not going to go in the bar. Right. Yeah. Because, and I'm not saying you shouldn't. Right. No, I totally get but, it. But me, you look at this, even if you don't know who Dale Brisby is, like this is a target. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> you know what I mean? And no I'm not, it, I'm it? not six one two thirty. <laughs> and it's just like we talked about. It's just like we talked about earlier when we first started this thing. If you want to be unique, you're going to stand out. Again, if you want, yep, and so it. you're the big guy, you stand out when you walk in. You're the you're the long haired guy, you stand out when yep. you walk in. It depends on like it, and and it is. It's one of those deals. Like man, come on, man. Like. <laughs> Yeah. Like I'm here just because I look different than you doesn't yeah. mean I'm a threat to you. And yeah. that's the whole deal. It's like, but to today and anytime you still have to be aware of your surroundings. And like, I, I don't sit with my back to the door. I, I, when I walk in a place, I analyze the whole situation, analyze, know where my exits are, know where to get yeah. away from stuff. You know I mean? Like I find a spot, like it doesn't matter where I go. I do that. And I think that's a mentality that you either have or you don't have. You're either a victim or you're you're not a victim, and yeah. and you know I mean like I I don't want to be a victim to anybody. I don't want to be a victim to a crazy guy that wants to steal your car. Yeah, I don't want to be you know yeah. I mean like I, you want to be aware of your surroundings, no doubt yeah. about it. And I'm no tech tech tactician or anything of that sort. I don't know any kind of self defense like martial arts or any of that stuff, you know. But it's like I I, I try to train and know what I can do. Yeah. And that's, that's what I do. So I think well. that that's an interesting time too. Cause it's like, I've, I've been very, very lucky in like any like sort of like weird altercations like that, even with like, um, like I'm, I'm like maybe 170, like I'm skinny. You know what I mean? Like sopping wet with chains on whatever. I'm like <laughs> 170 maybe. Yeah. And so like, now there's like MMA. There's everybody trains. Oh, everybody knows you. Do. Dude, like I've everybody. been very, very lucky. And like anybody that's ever like they don't know what they're doing because I sure don't. Yeah. And like it's it's something that was part of the wake up calls. It's like man, that dude could have taken that axe away from me. Yeah. Like it's like it could have it could have been a beer bottle and yeah. It, that, same you thing, know, you know, I mean, it is. You it never know what you yeah. never know who you're dealing with or what you're dealing with. And it don't matter if you're five foot seven and you weigh a buck sixty five. If you understand how to use uh, certain techniques. You're dangerous, oh, you yeah. know. I mean, and then you multiply that times a big guy, you're that much more dangerous, you know. I mean, yeah. it's a, it's something that you never know the day's world where you're at, who you're talking to, or what they can do. I mean, yeah. and it is that is the very truth of it. Man, the hardest well, I ever got hit, but was by a, was a linebacker, at my high school, and we were just we were all just boxing. It was like gloves or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I remember being like, there is at least a hundred pounds difference. <laughs> and I mean, like, I got rocked seeing stars. I was like, stop, stop. Yeah. <laughs> but it goes back to the, the young and stupid and wild uh, and, exactly. like, those those times. It's and, and I think that's that's important to talk about whenever you're, like, a young dude. Because there is, like, you, like, I look back or whatever, and it's like, that was, like, a completely other person. Right. Like, it's like, I don't even recognize. Mm. And, and I don't I don't drink. Eat, like, I've, I've never really drank or anything. So all my mistakes have been. Just solely <laughs> stupid. Like, there's no excuse. Well, thank you guys for coming on, sharing your stories, sharing uh, your experiences and advice. So, um, thank you guys for listening. This episode of Rodeo Time, the podcast. We are on to the next one. Check out Buster Frierson if you're interested in clinics. Uh, if you're interested in learning how to be a cowboy, check out Drew Merritt if you appreciate art like myself. And um, we're on to the next one. Old son. Let me roll this. Pow, pow. Outro music. Yeah. There it is. <laughs>